Luke chapter 13, if you take the word of God with me. And Luke 13, the gospel according to Luke in chapter 13. You know, so often when I come to the Lord in prayer, I don't know what to ask. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't know how to think about a situation. Something I'm facing, something I'm dealing with, I have to have the Lord help me know how and what to ask. Lord, help me, help me pray. Help me know how to pray. You know, so often we ask the wrong question. In life, we ask the wrong question to the Lord. Uh, we simply stay on the human level so often. Um, the psalmist said, Lift up our eyes into the hills from whence come with our help. But so often we, we, we look on the human level, on the human plane, on the horizontal plane. We forget to look up. We forget to consider him, to consider the Lord, and to take everything to the higher level, the eternal level. Looking at things from God's point of view, from eternity's point of view. Some of the things that we make ourselves sick over, worrying, if we would take the eternal look, we'd realize it really doesn't matter in eternity's view, that situation. That's what we see Jesus do here in Luke 13. He's actually in quite a political quandary, if you will, at the beginning of Luke 13, a, a political pickle, if you will. Uh, Jesus finds himself right here in the start of chapter 13 of Luke. We're not given the wording of the question exactly, but we are given the content of the question right in verse 1. Let's begin reading Luke 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them. So they've asked some question. They brought up some issue here. And now Jesus is answering uh, their question, uh, their issue, this thing they've brought to him. And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish. Or, now he brings up another issue. Or, those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, thank ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So, Pastor, I came for some good news this morning. Well, well, we'll come to that, but this is Jesus preaches what he's saying. You know, sometimes we need some bad news. We need to be awakened, don't we? Verse 6, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree, this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And the answer is said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. I'll bring you this title this morning. There's two words, wrong question. Wrong question. Let's pray together. Father, would you help us from your word now? Lord, there's heavy hearts, heavy things. There's uh, people that are carrying uh, burdens of, of all different types. Uh, certainly all of us have faced Difficult days and have difficult days yet ahead. And Lord, I pray that you teach us from your word how you work in the lives of men and how you're at work in our life so often that we would see beyond just what's right in front of us and things on a human level. We'd look to the Lord. We'd look to you and what you're doing in the situation, what you're doing in our own lives. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 mentions Pilate. Pilate, of course, is known and famous as the one that 
condemned the Lord Jesus and allowed the Jews to do what they could not do without his permission. They did not have the ability to crucify and put the Lord Jesus to death. And he, of course, is infamous, unfortunately, for that reason. But Pilate was not a popular ruler. You notice there in verse 1, uh, it talks about that these, these uh, Galileans, their blood, Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. Uh, Pilate was not a popular ruler for numbers of reasons. Uh, first of all, the Jews hated Roman rule. <laughs> and so the only reason Pontius Pilate was over uh, them is because the emperor uh, had put him in power and in control over the Jews there and over Judea. Uh, but Pilate exasperated the situation because he gave no consideration to the Jewish religion. He was completely insensitive to the, all their deep religious convictions. Uh, in fact, at one point he tried to bring uh, the Roman ensign right into Jerusalem and things. And uh, boy, they had a big riot, finally so much so that he removed it. Uh, these people would have given their lives and he moved it to Caesarea and things. He, they were against uh, this Roman rule and he had no uh, sensitivity to try to, you know, soft answer, turn the way wrath, to try to keep the peace that he was over. In fact, verse 1, the Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled, notice, with their sacrifices. So while they were engaged in their religious uh, sacrifices, the, the offering sacrifices there in the temple, he uh, had mingled, he had killed these Galileans right in that process. And what we gather from history from that event is this happened likely during one of the Jewish national feasts. And of course, during that time, nationalism would kind of swell and there'd be an increased uh, amount of people there in Jerusalem, like, like it was when Jesus was crucified and the crowds cried, crucify him. They were coming there for the Passover. And so during this Jewish event, Pilate, uh, history tells us, had soldiers that dressed as civilians and got among the people and with concealed weapons put to death a number of these Galileans right there and evidently right there by the brazen altar, right there where the blood was running from their sacrifices they had come to offer and it mingled their blood together. So uh, these unarmed Jews right there in the temple even, and so they were very upset and people were upset about this. So he's, at, he's being asked or brought up this loaded question, this loaded issue. Guess where the Lord Jesus is headed? He's headed to Jerusalem. If he condemns Pilate or speaks against Pilate, word will get to him before he gets to Jerusalem. And so this is a loaded question here for, for lots of reasons. If he doesn't condemn Pilate, they're going to think he's a Roman sympathizer and the people will be angry uh, that he doesn't stand with his people. He's not loyal to his people. In fact, Jesus, remember, was from Galilee, right? He was of Nazareth there up in that area. So uh, not only that, of course, the people bringing this are Ju uh, these down near Jerusalem in Judea. They were prejudiced against Galileans, too. And so uh, there's this, this uh, prejudice there about the Galileans, these country hicks, you know, uh, up there in Galilee, these, these uh, hillbillies. They're especially crude sinners, and surely they were uh, awful sinners. That's why this happened. That's what Jesus is speaking from what's in their mind, in their heart, as he says in verse 2. Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? That was their deduction. That was their reasoning. Well, these must have been awful sinners. Uh, that was common in that day. You remember when Paul was shipwrecked and they got put up on uh, Miletus or M Malta there and on that island and, and he was going to put more wood in the fire and, and a viper jumped out of the fire and, uh, and bit uh, Paul. And they said, well, good night. This man surely must have been a murderer because even though he was saved from the shipwreck, from the storm, uh, God's going to make sure he's put to death. And so they looked for him to swell and die. And then they realized, oh, he's not dying. So they assumed that the circumstance was a reason that he was a greater sinner. The disciples would do that. Remember, they walked along, saw this lame man and asked Jesus, was it his sin or his parents that caused this? And the truth is, you and I, sometimes we think that way too, don't we? Someone's having a lot of difficulty and problem. And sometimes it is the chase to the Lord. That's true. I think the person in the situation, if I'm having the difficulty, if I'm having the disease, if I'm having the family problem, I need to ask the Lord, Lord, is there some sin in me? Is there some sin 
that I am unaware of is, is maybe I already know, maybe the Lord's already telling me what it is. But you and I that are on the outside of that situation, we don't need to play God and point out and say, well, it's because of their sin. That may be, but guess what? Ye that without sin cast the first stone, right? That's what Jesus is trying to point out here. He's bringing this up. Hey, you think it's just because they were some awful sinners? Our Lord here removes their way of thinking and takes the whole issue to a higher level. I love this. He avoids politics completely here about Pilate or about the Galileans. Instead of discussing Pilate's sin, he dealt with the sins of the people that he's talking to. Why? Well, he can't help Pilate right now. You know why? Pilate's not there. <laughs> I do this often in counseling in my office and someone's bringing up a problem or issue or complaint about their family member or about a coworker. And as much as I'd like to help that person, I can through prayer, but I'm not sitting in front of that person. I can only help the person I'm talking to and help them to think like the Lord Jesus, help them, point them to the word of God. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He can't fix Pilate. Pilate's not here. Pilate's not standing there where he can talk to Pilate. But he says, I, I can help these people. And so he doesn't want to deal with Pilate's sin. He wants to deal with their sin. He wants to deal with your sin. He wants to deal with my sin. And so Jesus adds another incident here that happened right in their own backyard. Let's get, get the Galilean part out of this, shall we? Let's get away from that prejudice. That's what he's doing here. He says, how about this incident? Verse four, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Thank ye that they were sinners above all them that dwelt in Jerusalem. So this happened right in their backyard. This happened right near them. And he said, do you think, do you think that these people right here, do you think they were greater sinners than the rest of them that lived in Jerusalem? So he's removed the Galilean part out of that. You say, what's Jesus doing? Verse three, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Verse five, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What's Jesus doing in those verses? What's he, what's he saying? What's he trying to do here in this situation? Well, one thing is he's making it clear that human tragedies are not always divine punishments. Human tragedies are not always divine punishments. It's wrong for us to play God and pass judgment on people. Remember, that's what Job's friends did. Come on, Job, quit trying to hide it. We all know you're a sinner. You've been playing like you're real righteous and just, but we all know you've got hidden sin. Go, go ahead and confess it. Might as well get right. But that wasn't the case. It was just the opposite, wasn't it? God had said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? who loves righteousness, escheweth evil. It was just the opposite. But they, like many times you and I are guilty of, assumed it must be because of some sin. This, this, this is a divine punishment, the reason all that's happened to Job. And look, if, if we took that same approach to tragedy, we'd have a hard time explaining why the prophets suffered like they did. Why did the apostles and the apostle Paul and the rest of them, why did they suffer like they did then? In fact, why did our Lord, the Lord Jesus, why did he suffer like he did, he that was without sin? So if that's the logic we take to the end of, we know that's not really true in all cases. It is true in some cases. We all know that. The Bible is clear. The Lord does chasten and spank. Uh, he does discipline his ch children, but that's, that is for that person to ask God and for that person to seek that. And I think you should early in the situation, Lord, is there some sin, something I've omitted, something I've not realized? I want to be right with you. I want to go through this trial with you, not without you. I want to, I want to pass the test early. I don't want to have to repeat this subject. You see what I'm saying? But it's not for us on the outside to say, well, the reason that's happening because of this. Because the truth is, then there were the one like Jesus was talking about with the big beam in our eye. We're overlooking our sin and not dealing with 
what we need to deal with on our part. And so this is this kind of a similar thing. In fact, uh, this is a funny illustration I came across when the English, this is a true story, when the blind English poet up in years now, John Milton, uh, was visited. He was visited by Charles II, uh, the son of the king uh, that the Puritans beheaded. And, and now he's the king, Charles II, uh, there in England. He says uh, to uh, John Milton, your blindness is a judgment from God for the part you took against my father. Milton replied, if I have lost my sight through God's judgment, what can you say of your father who lost his head? Yeah. <laughs> See, Jesus went on to show the logical conclusion of their argument. If God does punish sinners in this way, then they themselves better get ready. That's what he's saying in verse 3 and verse 5. Look, if what you're saying is true, let me take you to the end of that argument. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Who here hasn't sinned? <laughs> That's what Jesus is saying. Who here hasn't sinned? Remember when they brought the lady caught in the midst of adultery? And Jesus said, he that was out, without sin cast the first stone. Well, there was only one there that was without sin. I mean, he, he wrote in the ground, you remember, I don't know if he wrote their sins or... I don't know. Interesting. But none of us are without sin. Every one of us, the label on our forehead is guilty, 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 guilty. If we didn't, we weren't guilty, we wouldn't need mercy. If we weren't guilty, we wouldn't need God's grace. But we're all guilty. We're all sinners. We're all condemned before a holy, righteous God. Again, the wrong question. The question is not why did these people die, these Galileans? Oh, why did these people die there at the tower in Siloam there? That's not the question. The question is, what right do you or I have to live? What right do you or I have to live? See, none of us are sinless. We all better be prepared Look, it's easier to talk about someone else's sin, talk about someone else's, other people's deaths, than it is to face our own sin and our possible death. The American uh, newspaper tycoon William, um, William Randolph Hearst would not permit anyone to speak or bring up the subject of death in his presence. Yet he died. Point unto man wants to die. Hey, if you ask, what is the death rate in Birmingham? Uh, it's 100%. 100%. It's one apiece. Look, I'll tell you, people are dying who never have before. Just a little humor there. It's okay. <laughs> God is so good to us. You know that? He's so good to us. Look, God is so gracious, so long-suffering toward me, toward you, toward all people. Long ago, some tower should have fallen on me. Long ago, I should have been struck down for my sin. So should you. God's been so merciful, so gracious, so long-suffering. I, I love 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Look, we all have those neighbors that we wonder, why has God allowed them to live? Why have good people I know died and God's let them live? They're ornery, they're rude, uh, they're living for the devil, wrong things. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But the truth is, I've got sin myself. I've received God's mercy this week too. God's grace has been extended and lavished on me this week too, see. What mercy, how good our Savior is, how good our God is. So what is Jesus doing here in verse 3? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In verse 5, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. 
Well, the primary interpretation here is certainly dealing with Israel, the nation of Israel. And hey, wholesale judgment is on the way. All the way through. Unless, unless national repentance happens in this day and hour that Jesus is speaking this to, to Israel, wholesale judgment's on the way. Jesus knew what was coming. Look, when he wept over Jerusalem, he saw them scattered. He not only knew what they were right then, but he knew what was coming for them and for their children. When they said, when they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate was saying, why would evil have done? They said, let his blood. And Pilate, remember, washed his hands. I'm, I'm, I'm guiltless from the blood of this man, which he couldn't do because he was the one that gave the order. He was the one that had to get permission. But he was trying to get the blood off his hands. And they said, let his blood be on us and our children. They didn't know how true that was going to be. Of course, we know the end of this generation. Wow, how the people perished. In AD 70, Titus, the Roman commander, came in and leveled the place. Many died like this. In fact, Israel ceased to exist after that for years for hundreds of years <laughs> till recently dispersed the Jews all that took place atrocities I want to see three things this morning as we lead it now into this parable Jesus tells after this number one I want you to see the barren tree the barren tree look at verse six he spake also this parable remember the Lord Jesus gives these parables they're an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and he's Pairing this with what he's just talked about. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. <laughs> Again, God is so good here. If you begin studying what is going on here. The, the parable, parable, again, primary interpretation is about the nation of Israel, but there's certainly an individual application here for each of us to take. Uh, for everyone, for all time. That's why God put it in His Word. Uh, God has been so good to Israel. And never a nation that was blessed like Israel. In fact, they were set up, they became a nation because of God's blessing. They weren't a nation. God says, I didn't choose you because you were a people that were stronger than everyone else. They weren't a people. It was one man. It was Abraham. They didn't exist as a nation. And God made them a nation. And God had been so good to Israel. You notice right here in verse number six, the Bible says that a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Now, this is interesting if you begin studying fig trees in the Bible days. Because the truth is, fig trees don't normally get to be in the vineyard. The vineyard is for vines and for grapes. No, no. Normally, fig trees had to eke out their existence in stony, inhospitable soil. That's where the fig trees were. But this fig tree, a certain man, by the way, the, the owner here is God. A certain man, he planted this fig tree in his vineyard so he is God has been so good to Israel he has given them exceptional privileges God has blessed them oh this particular fig tree has been given unique opportunities everything was done to make it fruitful in fact you could study in the Old Testament God speaks about his vineyard and the wild grapes and he built the tower and he, he, he put uh, all this for them. He, and he, he comes to the point where he actually asks Israel, what more could I have done? What else could I have done? What more could have been done, Israel, for you that I did not do? Everything was done to make them fruitful. Israel had been blessed with God's covenants, with God's commandments, Israel, God had sent them the patriarchs, they had the prophets, they had the princes, they had the priests, they had it all. What thanks did God get for all this? What thanks did he get? Verse 6, he came and sought fruit thereon and found what? 
None. The tree is barren. Boy, I can't help but think about my life. How good God's been to me. We all begin to think about all that God's done in all of our lives. All that God's put into us. The blessing, what he's allowed in our life. We just talked about Veterans Day. How good God's been that we live in America. We packed 10,000 meals this week in the school. Most of you know about that. No one has to pack food for us. We, we, we all, some of us have bloated stomachs, but it's not from not eating. Right? Yeah. No, we, God's been good to us. We didn't put on the only clothes we have. Some of you took a while to get dressed but because you're trying to figure out what you wanted to wear. Because you have so much stuff. We're just blessed. So blessed. Amen. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Not to mention, many of you, you were raised in church. You were raised in a drunkard's home or drug addict home. I know some of you were, but many of you, you've been raised around God's house and the word of God and prayer. That, that wasn't a foreign thing to you. God's place in your life. But even if, even if that wasn't the case right now, you are. You're in church. You have the word of God. You have the truth. God's been good to us. In fact, if you live in America, you can turn on the radio about any time of day and find a station where the preaching is going on, Bible's being read, prayer's being given, Christian music's on, turn on the TV, go on the uh, internet. It's, it's, it's everywhere. If you're looking for it, we have it. We're blessed. In fact, someone could ask, what more could be done for Americans to have the gospel? And not to mention, we're not in Maine or, or Vermont. We're down the Bible Belt. You, you, you find a church more than even Chick-fil-A, right? They're everywhere. God's been good to us. What more could be done? And yet God comes to the tree. It's barren, barren tree. Number two, you see the bitter truth. Look at verse seven. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Now the owner is God. The vine dresser is the Lord Jesus. Oh, think of it. For three years, Jesus had crossed and recrossed that vineyard. <laughs> He had, Jesus had worked and worked the soil, worked and worked the ground. Think about it. People would go, even those trying to find fault with Jesus, what'd they say? Never a man spoke like that man. He had taught the master teacher. He had done miracles so much so the Bible says that if everything was written down that he did, the books, the world could not contain the books. And yet three years he's come looking for fruit. None. None. They failed to see what God was doing. They failed to see what was happening right before their eyes, in their day, in their lifetime. Back up just a few verses. Look at Luke 12, verse 56. Look at it. Luke 12, verse 56. Jesus is preaching here. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? How do you not discern this time? All Old Testament was written about it. All the forefathers talked about it. All the prophets preached about it. You're living in the time of Jesus Christ. The Messiah's here. You can see the sky and it's red and no, the sailors to take warning. You, you can recognize what's going on, but how will you not see what's happening right in front of your eyes? Your religious leaders, that's what he's preaching, it's strong. You're God's people. See, God does more than enough to encourage us to repent. He does more than enough to encourage us to repent and bear fruit. Listen, he has every right to cut us down. <laughs> Back Lamentations talks about it as of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. It's because his compassions fail not. And Jeremiah writes, great is thy faithfulness. Because we should be consumed. 
You should be struck down. I should be consumed. When the fire of God looks upon me, I should be burnt up. I'm not pure and holy and righteous like him. But God's mercy, his compassion doesn't fail. What a savior we have. Now turn over to Matthew, would you please? Look at what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 3. Just back two books there. Look at the gospel record here according to Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus, Matthew 3, verse 7, but Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Idumea and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him. I'm in Mark. No wonder you guys are wondering where I'm at. That's a great passage too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's all good. Matthew chapter 3. <laughs> Matthew 3 verse 7. Let's try again. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Look, you don't bring the axe out unless you're planning on cutting something down. No fruit, cut it down. Listen, look, God has every right to cut us down. But his mercy. But for his mercy, he has spared us. Hey, but we dare not presume. We dare not presume upon his kindness. We dare not presume upon his long suffering. Because the day of the Lord, the day of judgment finally does come. Oh, he's long suffering, but it finally does come. The day of judgment will finally come. And let me say, if you don't know Jesus, your savior today, I want you to know God has given more days and more days for your soul. That's the reason he hasn't come. He's not slack concerning his promise to some account slackness, but his long suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish. He's talking about you, that all should come to repentance. But there is a final no to the Lord. I don't know where, where or when that final no is, but there is a final no where someone that God has dealt with their heart and they've heard the gospel and again and again, and they say no, no. No, and there is some point somewhere, I don't know where it is, but there is a final no and the end comes, whether death, whether the Lord Jesus return. I'm telling you, don't presume upon God's goodness. Someone says, well, I'll get saved next time. There may not be a next time. You may not go back. You may not hear the gospel again, not because you die tomorrow, but you finally turn from God where you have no more heart to hear. The Bible says, it's not that they couldn't hear, but they've stopped their ears from the truth. Listen, you think I'm just going to go out and have a little more fun in the world and then come back. Don't think once you cut loose from the shore and cut loose from the anchor, don't, don't presume that you'll ever come back. You may never wake up. You may never as the prodigal come to yourself and think, what am I doing? Don't presume upon the Lord. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, your Savior today, I beg you, today is the day. Now is the accepted time to be saved. Don't presume upon God's goodness and mercy because the truth is the day comes finally when his judgment does fall. He's merciful. He's long suffering. But what you and I have coming, what we deserve, you don't want to reserve. You don't want to get what you deserve. You do not want his judgment. You want his mercy. And his mercy is still extended. Oh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Agree with God, I'm a sinner. Turn from your sin, repent, turn to him and say, Jesus died for me, I believe. He died for my sin. 
I receive him as my Savior. He, he will save you today if you'll trust him as your Savior. Look at God's question in verse 7. Notice it. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, verse 7, and find none, cut it down. Notice the question here. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why cumbereth it the ground? Far from being useful, Israel was actually spoiling the good ground it was in. You see, God had made Israel to be the shining light on a hill. God had made Israel, the whole purpose of Israel is that they would be a beacon. They would be a light, like David said, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. That was the point. That was the purpose of Israel. God doesn't believe in elitism and Israel was his chosen ones and no one else could get in. No, their purpose was that they would be the shining light so everyone would come to Israel. Like, like it was in that small little window of David and Solomon and the Queen of Sheba came and said, the half has not been told of all that God's done here in Israel. That everyone would come to Israel and hear the truth and know the great God that loved his people and that was merciful that was the point. God intended Israel to be smack dab in the midst of the nations of the world to be a testimony, a blessing to all mankind. Was that happening? No, no. Cut it down. That was the word from on high. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? So we see the barren tree, the bitter tree. Thirdly, lastly, we see the, the borrowed time. Oh, I love this. The gardener intercedes. Notice verse 8 and 9. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. I love this when you think about Jesus. Jesus didn't speak judgment. Jesus, his own disciples would say, let's bring fire down from heaven and just consume them. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to destroy man. I came to save them. And God, the owner is saying to the gardener, Jesus, cut it down. And Jesus says, give it one more year. Let me dig about it. Let me dung it. Maybe he's speaking about the digging for his burial. Maybe his body would be the fertilizer needed. And if not, if it doesn't bear fruit after I die, after I give my whole self, then God, you can cut it down. That's what he says there. Notice that the owner says to the gardener, you cut it down. And Jesus pleads, let's give it one more year. And afterwards, thou cut it down. Jesus didn't come to cut it down. Jesus didn't come to destroy. That was not his intent. Listen, we were condemned already. The wrath of God was already on us. We didn't need any further condemnation. We were already headed to hell. We already had no hope. Jesus came and brought hope. He brought salvation. He brought a way to escape the damnation we already deserved. Oh, what a Savior we have. Borrowed time. Cut it down now, Jesus says. Give it one more year. One more year. One more year. Hmm. What a Savior we have. I think about your life and my life. We've already said how we've deserved a tower to fall on us. We deserve. We're sinners. Yet how many times you wonder the Lord Jesus interceded on your behalf, on my behalf. Jesus did give his life, of course. The nation Israel is given this second chance and the Son of God is gone, but God doesn't stop working. What happens? Pentecost happens. Though the Son of God has ascended, the Spirit of God comes down. And the Spirit of God begins to work. No one sees the power of the Spirit of God, the power of the gospel of God, like Israel sees it. 
Boy, the gospel goes forward. Jerusalem church blossoms. The gospel heads all over the world and they get to see front row, front and center, the power of the Holy Spirit of God and the power of the gospel, the power of his church. God's spirit and man, oh wow, what they get to see. The first century church gave the nation of Israel a powerful witness of the power of the gospel message. But the Jews over and over again, having resisted the Son of God, crucified Him, now the Jews as a whole reject the Spirit of God. So sadly, finally, the borrowed time runs out. The tree was cut down. Now, by the way, we're enamored at the mercy of God because the goodness of God here, he says, give, me, give him one more year. God gives him 40 more years. For Jesus, three years, he's come seeking fruit. There's none. Jesus intercedes, give him one more year. It's 40 more years before Titus comes and levels the place. Huh. And guess what? Still no fruit. So what's the conclusion, Pastor? What's the point for us today? Well, listen, we, we want to ask... Why did our missionary die? Why did our friend, why did he die? So brutally, why? That's the wrong question. The question is, why has God allowed you to live? Why has God allowed me to live? It's interesting if you notice here, verse 9, it says, And if bear fruit, well, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman with a spirit of infirmity. And the, the, the text moves on. The narrative moves on. And this is significant because we are all sitting here asking, what happened to the tree? What happened to the tree? We're not told. God leaves the parable here open-ended. It's as if the Lord is saying to the listeners, you, your life ends the story. Your life supplies the conclusion to the story. It's not the only time in the word of God this type of uh, literary um, move is made. The book of Jonah ends much the same way. There's no conclusion. It's left open-ended. You and I today, our life is supplying the answer. Did the tree bear fruit? Uh, we understand the primary interpretation in Israel, but there is a personal application here, individual application. Can I ask you, did the tree bear fruit? Did the special care by the gardener digging about it, dunging it, all that God has done in our life, did, it, did the special care accomplish anything? Was the tree spared or cut down? We have no way to know the answer to that question here in the text. But we can answer as far as our own lives are concerned. Again, wrong question. The question is not what happened to the fig tree, but what will happen to me? What will happen to you? Go back to the beginning. Jesus saying, do you think these Galileans were sinners more than all the other Galileans? Do you, do you think that these in Jerusalem at the Tower of Siloam fell, do you think they were sinners more than all else that dwelt in Jerusalem? What did he say? Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Hey, friend, God is seeking fruit. These three years I've come seeking fruit. Matthew 3, we read, the axe is laid to the roots. Every tree that beareth not fruit is cut down. God is seeking fruit. He'll accept no substitutes. The time to repent is now. Look, as we heard the tragedy this week with our missionary family, we must not ask the wrong question. We rather ought to ask ourselves this morning, Am I cumbering the ground? Am I just taking up space? Or am I bearing fruit to God's glory? The Bible says in verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. 
and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. God expects something out of our life. What right do you have to live? What right do you have to live if you're not bearing fruit? What right do I have to live if I'm not bearing fruit? Perhaps you or I are living on this borrowed time. Perhaps the Lord Jesus has already interceded this one more year. Lord, give him one more year. God's looking for fruit. What will be the conclusion? Will there be fruit or cut it down? Will you bow your heads in prayer with me?